doing today? So, welcome to Woodcraft. My name's David. Uh, we're going to be talking about how to do some of these uh, knife kits that are that are available to us. Uh, there's a wide range of kits. Uh, there's hunting kits. There's uh, some very lovely personal defense kits and whatnot. Um, there's also a large range of kitchen uh, knife kits. Um, one thing that all of these kits have in common is the type of steel that is in them. Uh, they are all stainless steel of one form or another. Uh, this gives them a, a really nice cutting edge. It also means that they're very easy to clean. Uh, they do generally have a pretty good long life to them. Um, and again, you can get them in a wide variety of types, sizes, you know, so forth. Uh, what we're going to be working on today is this little kit. Uh, this is one of Woodcraft's uh, kits that we've had for quite some time. Uh, it's also the kit that we uh, put together when we do our knife, uh, our knife kit class. Um, it's a really nice kit to work with as a first time kit because everything is included. Comes with its own sheath. Blade comes pre-sharpened. The comes with uh, straight metal pins as versus the uh, screw together style rivets that some of the kits come with. So it comes with a little package of aluminum pins, which are very easy to work with. And the material that we're going to be using for today's scales is walnut. Um, material choice is something that you have a lot of option for. You know, you can, I would recommend a hardwood. I wouldn't recommend most of the softwoods because uh, obviously they can get damaged a little more easily. So any of the hardwoods, uh, most of the kits that are out there, uh, because of the length of the because of the length of the handle, uh, if you're going to buy a bunch of pre-cut blanks, I would buy five inch to six inch long blanks. Uh, if you cut your own then anything from 3 8 to about a half inch thick. If you go much more than a half inch, you're going to end up uh, most likely sanding down a large amount of that blank. Uh, you figure a half inch thick blank plus an eighth of an inch spine, you're an inch and an eighth thick wrapped up in your hand. Uh, that can get to start feeling really bulky really quick. So that's... Uh, that's what we're going to be doing is, is these. Now, the first question that I always, always get is, how do I go through and drill them? Well, we have our drill press set up with a 5 millimeter drill bit, a uh, 4 millimeter drill bit in this one's case, a uh, 4 millimeter drill bit set up. And I'm going to show you what, what I do on all of mine. Uh, this is double stick tape. Um, you can try using these uh, scotch tape type double stick tape. It doesn't adhere real well to wood, in my opinion, and it adheres even worse to metal. So not really my favorite option, but you can try it out. Uh, this stuff will stick to just about anything and will try not to ever let go, as you'll probably see me fighting with this, trying to get these apart later on. Take, uh, take two pieces and stick them together. Try and have them relatively lined up with one another. A little bit of pressure on them for just a second. Take a second piece. And I'm not tearing big pieces off here or anything. Uh, this stuff sticks well enough that I don't need huge pieces. I'm not even trying to get it to cover the entire scale. I just want it to have a spot to hold on to. Yeah, let's see if we can get that off of there. There we go. Okay. Now, this knife 
there's a picture on here that uh, is kind of an example of how they describe the handle. Uh, you can kind of see the, the handle starts up here across the right behind the Ricasso area and then tapers down to right uh, behind the thumb guard. That's an option. How you design this is completely up to you. You know, a similar style kit is this one. And you can see on this one, we just did a straight handle right through there. The thumb protection is completely covered um, and goes all the way back, follows the back curve of the blade. So uh, I've, I've done this class with dozens of people and uh, every one of them has turned out differently. Uh, do we have any questions so far? Yes. Uh, what brand of double-sided tape is that? So the question I got was what uh, brand of double stick tape? Uh, this is spec tape. Uh, you can usually find it in one inch or two inch uh, wide pieces. Uh, for these purposes, the one inch does perfectly and a little goes a long way. Uh, this roll, oh, I don't know, this roll is a couple of years old at this point. So, um, if you're not sure how you want to profile the front of the blade, you know, you, you've looked at it, you've got a piece, but you're just not quite sure how you feel about that front, front edge, um, I would take the blade and set it as far forward as you can. That way you have the material up here to do whatever you choose to. Uh, I would recommend you leave yourself at least an eighth of an inch of wood all the way around your, where your pins are going. Uh, start getting much thinner than that and it's pretty easy to blow out that, that section. Um, so we have that all stuck together and we'll take a black sharpie. A pen works just as well uh, or pencil. I'm going to trace the outline of the kit. All the way around here. Now this is going to give me a pretty wide profile uh, and I'll show you what I mean here in just a second. A pen or pencil that's nice and sharp is going to be able to trace quite a bit closer to the body of this. And when I cut this out on the bandsaw, I'm going to want to stay either on the line or outside of the, outside of the line. Now, this one, I did the same way. I traced it out with a Sharpie. And I'm not sure how well it's going to show up but there's a fair amount of material that is overhanging the, uh, the blade, the handle itself, the tang. And if I had used a pencil or a pen where I might have gotten a nicer, sharper line closer in, I wouldn't have quite as much material overhanging in through here. But it all works. So I've got my piece outlined. I'm all locked together. I'm ready to actually go ahead and drill my holes. So we're going to step over here to our bandsaw. Yeah, sorry. We're going to go over here to the drill press. We'll use the bandsaw in a moment. Um, the drill press is currently sitting at right around 1600 RPM. Um, and let's see, where'd the switch go? There it is. Oops. Use the lasers to get close to. Okay. So what I'm going to do here is use the, the pinhole that's already drilled in the tang as my guide for where to drill these. Since the blocks and the blade are all taped together at the same time, the, the holes should line up perfectly.
I'm using the laser that's on the drill press to figure out where the, the bit's going to land. Since this is a four millimeter bit going through a four millimeter hole, essentially, I want that to be dead on every time. Side, but that's not really going to matter because the tear out's just going to get sanded down, sanded off when uh, when we go in to do our final shaping. One thing to consider uh, right about this point is a lot of these knife kits come with a lanyard hole. Now, if it's a, a single hole that would just where you would just drill it out now would be the right time to go ahead and drill it out. Uh, this one is actually a slot, but I'm going to leave this covered in this case. So go ahead and take the knife off here. And say so that was holding on pretty well there for just a little piece of double-sided double tape. Um, we'll step back over to the bench for just a second. So one thing I did forget to mention, and that is these blades come with an edge already. They're already sharp. Um, in fact, the uh, lovely bandages that I'm currently sporting are from a similar knife kit that uh, I forgot that little bit of wisdom on. So as you can tell from this fine piece of craftsmanship here, some simple blue painter's tape wrapped around the blade is a very good thing to do. Uh, it'd be a very good idea to wrap those up and, uh, and uh, keep your fingers away from them while you're doing all of this because it's very easy to grab hold of this blade as you're working. Um, we've got these drilled. So you'll notice on this piece, the tape is actually sitting right where the, where the body of the tang was. When I peel this piece of tape off, obviously I'm going to lose that. So I'm going to peel it off. And then go ahead and set this back down. Now, especially doing this with a marker, this doesn't have to be a super precise replacement because this thing's going to draw a nice wide line anyways. Now I've got my pattern put back together. Um, so at this point, uh, we're going to go ahead and move to the bandsaw. Oh, sorry, one other thing. Uh, since we're going to cut our profile out on the bandsaw now, uh, this is kind of one of your last chances to, de to decide what you want to do here. Um, the one that I started for us yesterday, I started right uh, right at the front of the finger well uh, finger guard and cut back from there up across the top uh, just to create a little different profile on this one I'm actually going to come from right at the top of the well and pull forward I will end up with all of the finger well and most of this portion here exposed. All right, let's move over to the, to the bandsaw.
So the blade that's on here at the moment is a little bit heavy. It's a little bit wide for doing some of these inside cuts that are on here. Uh, so what I'm going to end up doing is a whole series of relief cuts across here so that the blade doesn't get bound up. Now, the rest of this, since I've drawn, I'm going to do a nice broad curve here. I'm not worried about doing relief cuts up in this section. So we'll knock a little off the front here. And basically just start trimming this blank down. All righty. If any of y'all noticed how fast that slowed down, it was one of the lovely features of this particular bandsaw, and that is it has a foot brake instead of waiting for an inordinate amount of time for it to spin down on its own. All right. So we've got our roughed out blank. Now, as you noticed when I took the knife off of here, this tape does a pretty good job of holding on to. And that was while I had two nice square pieces that were solid to grab hold of. This has now been embedded inside here. And let's see if it's going to come free cleanly. It's probably not. So take the tip of a pocket knife here. And go right down inside just a little bit. And grab a little screwdriver because I was having the exact same problem yesterday. There we go. So, hopefully that answers any concerns about whether or not the tape holds well. But, it holds that well, but when we take it apart here, it doesn't leave a lot of residue. So that's awfully nice. See? Back to nice and clean. All right. Now... I've got my two pieces. It's very easy to tell that this was the outside of this one. And from the, from the small amounts of blowout, obviously this was the outside of this one. Now, now that they're separated though, I don't want them to get mixed up. So I'm going to actually just put an eye 
on the inside of both of these so that I know from this point forward which side was which. And that is going to end up sitting there. like so. And the pins that we have, there are our pins. Let go. See, they even managed to use good tape here. Yeah, these are the aluminum pins that this kit comes with. Um, I always recommend dry fitting all of this stuff together because it's not hard for these to be pretty tight and it's easy for them to get stuck. We're going to be putting this stuff together with five minute epoxy. Um, so you do have a little bit of working time, but not a huge amount. So. And make sure everything's sliding through there just fine. Oh, had a little more blowout than we thought. Okay, that's all good. So, to keep everything moving in the same order, I like to kind of build these like a sandwich. I'll take one scale, set the pins in, drop the knife on top, and then drop, take the last one and drop it in place. That way I keep all of my surfaces in the same order and I can remember which one is the top side, which one's the bottom. Um, so we're gonna be using uh, some System 3 uh, Quick Cure 5. It's a five minute epoxy. It's five minute epoxy because it has about a five minute working time. Um, the, this is a great epoxy for doing this with because you can set it up, clamp it, leave it alone for half an hour or so, come back and continue working on it. The one thing that I have found with five minute epoxy is it has a breaking temperature at about 125 degrees. And, you know, it's like, okay, no big deal. Well, these kits, like this one, are essentially a type of skinning knife. You're going to use it out in the field. You're going to use it a little bit, come home and wash it, and use it again in a few months or something. Kitchen knives, where you're using them all the time and washing them all the time, it's not hard for your hot water heater to be set at a temperature higher than this can handle. You wash it a bunch of times and all of a sudden the handle starts to come apart. So if you're using, doing a knife that you actually think is going to get used quite a bit, the T88 that System 3 sells or the structural epoxies that some of the other companies have is a better choice. This stuff has a breaking temperature at 165 degrees. You can hand wash this all day long and you're not going to damage that epoxy. Um, so that would be my recommendation for kitchen knives or anything of that sort where you really do know you're gonna be using it frequently. So I'm gonna mix up a little bit here. Do we have any other questions or anything? going on? No questions yet. No, oh, we haven't received any more questions. Darn, I must actually be doing a good job at this. All right. You, you people need to ask more questions because if you don't, everybody thinks I'm doing well and then they make me do more of these. And you'll have to hear me even more often and that would just be terrible. <laughs> uh, just mixing up, you know, this stuff is basically 50-50. Um, 
I'm not trying to be real precise or anything with the measurements. A glob of one and a glob of the other. Uh, if the two globs are about the same size, then I should be at about 50-50. So far, I haven't had any of them break down because I wasn't being accurate. Take a piece of scrap here, mix it up. It'll usually get all bubbly and kind of foamy for a moment, turn white. As soon as it starts going back to truly clear all over, you're all nice and mixed up. Yeah, that should do well. All right. Get it on everything. Now, for demonstration purposes, I am not wearing gloves. Guess what? I'm probably going to regret it by the end of this step. Um, you want every surface covered with this epoxy. You don't need a real thick layer or anything, but you do want it on everything. On the wood, on the pins, everything. those, set that on there, drop that on top, get those pins lining up together, same time, oh, come on, come on, there, there's there, if you have any questions about this step of the process so far, that's going to get nice and messy here in a moment, ooh, I what is the coldest temperature you should use for a metal epoxy? Coldest temperature? Um, below about 65 or so, it's going to take it a lot longer time to set up. Um, if you get below 50, it's probably not going to react at all. And I've got one pin that decided it wanted to be that didn't want to play well. Let's try going the other direction here. Grab me a little hammer or something real quick. Oh, that worked. Okay, we got that one in. And yep, and now I've got epoxy on my hands. Uh, until it dries, acetone is the generally the easiest way to clean this mess up. Um, after it dries, time and patience are going to be the easiest way to clean this up. Maybe a chisel if you don't like your skin. Right, smear that all over there again on the other piece. Make sure we still got it on the pins. Now, the pins are cut oversized. They're cut oversized on purpose because obviously you could be doing this with whatever thickness of wood you wanted to. Um, I'm going to shove these through a little bit. Come on. I just, I'm just spreading them so that they're, you know, all the way through on both sides. The one thing I don't want it to do is end up uh, shallow on one side because then I'm going to have to sand down to it. Uh, some F clamps or spring clamps to just put some pressure on this while it dries. 
Again, in about five minutes, this stuff is going to be worthless. Uh, this pad here, I won't even be able to scoop it or stir it or anything in just a couple of more minutes. Uh, but uh, cure time on this is pretty much a half an hour or so. You know, after about a half hour, you can start messing with it. So we've got that one set up. It's going to dry. I'll end up uh, finishing it off at a later date. And that brings us to this one that I was doing yesterday. Now, obviously, this thing is still pretty rough. I was using uh, different pins. I had some brass pins for it, uh, and uh, we'll see how this we'll see how this goes through the sanding process. Um, do we have any Do we have any questions? Yes. Are the assembly and epoxy steps the same when using different pins like the mosaic? Pen? So the question, a uh, very good question, the question that uh, somebody just wrote in was, is the assembly steps the same and the epoxy the same if you choose to use the mosaic pins? And the answer to that is essentially yes. Uh, mosaic pins are very pretty. Uh, you know, the, the contrast that they can create is exceptional. Uh, but on their outside, they're still essentially a straight pin. So the assembly and epoxies that you would use are the same for that. Right. Now my fingers are getting sticky. <laughs> so we've got this one. I've got the, the pins are all in there. It's all glued together. Um, the sander that we've got here is a 1x42 belt sander. It does have a disc on the side. I find the disc sander part, the disc side of it, to be less useful most of the time than the narrow belt. Um, the uh, sanders like this you can get in several different sizes, anywhere from a hundred bucks to several hundred bucks. You know, it just depends on who you want to go shopping with. Um, the ones that the professionals use, I can guarantee you, are for the professionals. Uh, they're one inch or two inch wide belts, and they're running several grand on most of those machines. Um, now, one thing that I've had uh, that I comment on with all of my students, and most of them find out again afterwards, it's uh, one of those lessons where you can tell somebody not to stick their hand in a fire and they usually do it once anyways. I'm gonna be using this thing to actually sand down and grind down these pins. The brass, aluminum, they're soft enough that these grinders don't care. <coughs> Excuse me, these sanders, they, they don't care. Uh, what you will care about is the heat that is generated from abrading this metal, particularly if you have your hand sitting on the back side of it. Uh, sanding these down is going to create a lot of heat in that pin. You happen to put your finger on the back side of it while you're doing it, and it's going to feel like you're touching a brand. So watch where your hands go when you start sanding on these. We're going to switch over here. Uh, hopefully you'll still be able to hear me easily enough when we, uh, when we kick this on. Uh, the belt that's on here right now is an 80 grit belt. Should work well for, for our uh, just general purpose sand down work. So we're going to take just sand this down. I want to keep it moving so that I'm not wearing out one particular part of the uh, of the piece. I also want to jump from pin to pin. I don't want to create a lot of heat right around the pin. I don't want that epoxy to fail. Eventually, we will manage to get them all the way down 
I usually cut mine a little bit long. I had these left over from another one that I had heavier scales on, and these are obviously quite a bit thicker than I was planning. And there we are, we're down to the wood on that one. Step over here, finish this one off real quick. There we are, we're pretty much down to the wood on that one. Whoops, found it. I found the top side of that pin. Boy, it's still hot. Now we've got those pretty much sanded down. Um, I'm going to actually work on the back side of this. Because these are stainless steel blades, the sanders can easily start reprofiling the metal too if you sand down far enough. Uh, this has its advantages because you can do things like marking the blades, spine, or uh, standing your own profiles, kind of whatever you want with it. You also want to keep moving here. The, as you're sanding, you're sanding through that epoxy. Uh, if you're, if you stick in one spot, and you get a lot of epoxy built up on the sandpaper, it'll end up just wearing it out. You'll, you'll end up burning through the sanding belts faster than uh, you would otherwise. We have one of those rubber abrasive disc cleaners in here. Can you grab one from off the floor? Working through here, working this down. You can see where, you know, I'm actually seeing the, the, the spine where it's not showing the abrasion is where I've still got a gap. Where I've still got a gap between the wood not being completely in line with the metal yet. So we're going to keep working that a little bit further. So end grain on cuts like this is a little more likely to start burning. The other thing that that's telling me is my belt is starting to get a bit worn, starting to get some load up on it. Uh, if you've never seen one of these, they are an abrasive, they're a cleaning stick essentially. They're a type of rubber material that you can use to clean belts like these. Uh, they last a long time. A uh, stick like this probably lasts most shop owners five or six years. Simple to use. And now 
now my belt's looking a lot closer to new than what it was before. A little bit of flaking on there, that's just the rubber that was stuck. And about that much time and all is all it takes to clean the belt back up. Get set back up here. And as you can see, I'm actually taking off the uh, parts that I was burning before. So uh, at this point, I would just continue all the way around. Um, the, disc, the belt on here works really well for the long flats that are here and here. Getting into the finger wells that are in here works really well with either a oscillating spindle sander or you can buy sanding drums that go onto a drill press. Those are really effective as well. Um, you know, as you're going through, you're going to be testing it with your hand, seeing how it fits. Uh, what a lot of my students have found is if the edge here or here is a nice hard 90 degree, it never feels comfortable. It always feels like it's digging in. So if you take the sander and just kind of start breaking those edges down, it'll instantly start feeling more comfortable. Um, I'm not going to go through and do the entire rest of the blade. One, we're running out of time. And, you know, from this point forward, it's a matter of how you want to have everything profiled. You know, you can cut grooves in here where your fingers would sit. Uh, but for the most part, you're going to follow this pattern all the way around, get it all nice and lined up with the, with the metal, break the edges over. Uh, if you're working with, you know, this, like I said, this is a fairly thin handle, so I wouldn't be worried about a whole lot of contour. If you're dealing in a heavier handle, you know, this one is still fairly straight. It has had the edges broken over and it feels pretty, pretty comfortable in my hand. Um, but if this handle was much thicker, I would also want to make sure I was contouring this direction so that the whole handle actually rounds over. That way it actually fits in the, the swell of my hand a little better. Um, now, as, oh, it looks like we may have a question. What? Um, yes. Um, is there anything that you would want to shape before you glue it all together? There is actually one section, and it'll be very easy to show the, the answer to the question. The question was, is there any part of this that I would have wanted to do before I got it all glued together? Uh, and the answer to that is yes. If you look on this one, this section right in here is still really rough. Now, I can do this part by hand, at this point, if I start trying to use a sander, it's going to be almost impossible for me not to scratch and nick this front section of the blade. So if I intend to do it with a sander, I would want to do all of my profiling here before I actually glue these to the blade. So while they were still double stick taped together is actually the best time to shape this section. Um, and it's also why you want to decide what kind of design you want at that point. So, yeah, that is one area that we're, uh, for this blade, you know, it would have been nice if I had done that ahead of time. Uh, do we have any other questions? Okay. One last comment, and that is finishes. These two knives have very different finishes on their handles. This one is... Uh, either a polyurethane or a lacquer of some kind. It is a finish that actually builds a film up on top of the up on top of the handle. Any of these that you want to use is fine. This one has an oil finish, either mineral oil or tongue oil on it. This kind of finish is what I would recommend for any of the knives that you intend to uh, use frequently and wash frequently because this is going to be much easier to maintain than this is. Uh, if this starts, you know, you wash the handle and it starts looking like it's getting a little dry, you just add a little bit more oil on it and then let it dry again. So 
Uh, mineral oil, tongue oil, either of those work great for the kitchen knives, uh, the nice gloss polyurethane lacquers uh, work really well for any of your display knives. So I think that about covers it. Uh, we hope to see you or have you join us next weekend. And uh, we are going to be doing a, a demo this upcoming Thursday as well. So if you would like to join us for that, we look forward to having you. Have a good afternoon.